Dear participants, welcome to the 16th Sea Change webinar, the sixth one in the 2013 series, collaboratively being developed between Sea Change Community of Practice and Ms. Tina Rossing, former CARE International Climate Change Adaptation Coordinator. This webinar is one of two webinars taking place today under the title Monitoring and Evaluation for Community-Based Adaptation, Unpacking the CARE, PMURL and RCAP approaches and their interconnection. And we start this morning with Ms. Tina Rossing, who I will introduce in a moment. And later in the afternoon uh, at 4 o'clock Indochina time, we will have the webinar with Lucy Faulkner. And right now we have 25 participants and with close to 160 registrations, I'm expecting some more people to log in over the next minute. And having said that, I have to compliment Daniela Terizo because she is probably in the earliest time zone. She is logged in from Morocco and it's uh, 3 o'clock at night there. So congratulations on still being up at this time. Shows a lot of interest in this webinar. And um, if you, by the way, as participant would be in an earlier time zone, do let me know and I'll give you credits as well. You can type that in the, in the chat window. Um, my name is Dennis Boers and I'm the Sea Change team leader and I'll introduce Ms. Rossing in a moment to you. As already said, um, this is one of two webinars taking place today and um, CARE International's global response to climate change is facilitated and dedicated I'm doing something wrong here, is facilitated and dedicated by the Secretariat located with the Confederation's Poverty, Environment and Climate Change Network, and that's PECN. And Ms. Tina Rossing was one of the developers of the CARE Participatory Monitoring, Evaluation, Reflection and Learning, PMURL, for Community-Based Adaptation Manual, which is a manual for local practitioners. And the CARE PMURL manual supports a methodology that can help measure, monitor and evaluate changes in local adaptive capacity within vulnerable communities for better decision making on community-based adaptation. By presenting a participatory methodology for developing and monitoring against CBA indicators, it provides a new platform for local stakeholders to articulate their own needs which is fundamental part of building and strength strengthening adaptive capacity. The PMURL methodology also responds to the need for continuous feedback and joint learning and communication in order for CBA to be flexible in light of the challenge of uncertainty. The recording of this webinar and also the documents that are going to be discussed will be made available through the following link. And once the recording has been put online, you will also receive an email giving the link to the recording. As some of you attendees might already know about Sea Change, you might already be Sea Change member, uh, but I would like to take a little moment to explain uh, that the Sea Change community of practice is uh, what we are doing. With currently over 650 members, uh, we try to develop a culture of high quality and rigorous m and &E frameworks, approaches and methodologies for responses and interventions to climate change related practices in Asia and beyond. And webinars like this one is one way in which Sea Change is sharing knowledge to improve m and &E pra practices. But next to webinars, we also send out a weekly newsletter. We maintain a resource library and we support our members in speaking engagements at conferences and also in publishing their work. And for more information, I would like to guide you to our website www.cchangecop.org. And having said that, let me now introduce you to our presenter of today, Ms. Tina Rossing. Ms. Tina Rossing is a climate change adaptation specialist with 20 plus years experience in the fields of climate change adaptation, biodiversity conservation and poverty alleviation gained from working in 27 countries on four continents. 12 years were spent on designing, managing and monitoring global environment facility funded projects while Ms. Rossing was also CARE International's global climate change adaptation coordinator for the past three years located within the PEC and Secretariat. And in this capacity, she has also led the development and rollout of climate adaptation learning products, tools and processes, including training. 
a little bit logistics of this webinar. I'm currently giving the five minutes introduction and a little bit of logistics. And after this, there will be 40 to 45 minutes uh, by Ms. Tina Rossing on the care premural approach. And after that, we'll have 20 to 30 minutes Q&A. And we hope to answer all the questions within these 20 to 30 minutes. If we wouldn't manage to answer your question, we will make sure that it gets answered offline and we will put it on our website. The link that we provided before and the link that is provided here will also be the location um, where you will find uh, answers to questions that have not been answered in the Q&A session. And it is also the link where the recording will be put online. Oh, I see. I switched two slides. Well, my name is Dennis Boers. I'm the Sea Change team leader. And um, I manage the Sea Change community of practice and online knowledge platform on the m and &E of climate change intervention. The Q&A session, during this session, you can simply type your question or your comments in the question window that you have uh, in the interface of GoToWebinar. You can already type your questions during the presentation, so feel free if a question pops up to immediately start typing so that we can ask you for a little bit clarification if that would be needed. In the end, in the Q&A session, we will read out your question towards Ms. Rossing and she uh, will answer those questions. And having said that, with this introduction, I would like to now stop talking, hand over the microphone to Ms. Tina Rossing. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? I hear you fine, Tina. Okay, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. You need to let me know if there's a delay because I, I have... Um, and yes, I see your screen. I see the presentation in your, uh, in your uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so what I'll do now is I'll turn it over to to my PowerPoint. Do you see that now? It's now turning over and yes it's full screen. Fantastic, okay. Well good evening ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really happy that there's so many of you who could, at could attend. So how I, the way I would like to start this webinar is to just give you a very uh, quick outline of some of the points I hope to cover in, in this presentation. First of all, I, I would like to set off by uh, outlining a few key questions that are kind of out there in terms of community-based adaptation and m and &E. Then that leads into uh, uh, a question like, what is community-based adaptation? Because there's also quite a lot of confusion about that. And then that leads me into how is m and &E for CBA different than what we generally would call standard m and &E for, for, for regular development projects? Then I'm going to get into what the PMO, or the Participatory Monitoring and Evaluation, uh, Reflection and Learning uh, Methodology and Manual is all about. Um, and then I want to elaborate a little bit about who, who it's for. Then I want to take you guys into what the processes are that we are dealing with through, through the PMO methodology. And then I want to get into a little bit about how we have been trying um, to take this theory and essentially convert it into practice to a rollout within not only care but also with some strategic partners. And then I want to end a little bit, a little bit with what the benefits and what the limitations are of this methodology because it's definitely, while it has benefits, there are also some some, some important limitations to it. Tina, that can you can you speak up a little bit more? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. That actually provides a, uh, a very important segue into the second part of this webinar that, that Lucy Faulkner is going to facilitate later today. Um, because I want, I, I want to show what the connection between the PMO and the ARCA m and &E methodology is. Um, so as an introduction, the well, community-based adaptation, or CBA from here on after, is a growing field. There is a general confusion among um, different people involved in this, in other words, the practitioners, researchers, and, and policy makers. What is CBA? And as such, what constitutes effective or, or good CBA? 
This raises a few other important questions such as what do we need to measure to prove that CBA is effective and how do we do that? And then finally, who should actually define what we, did, what we mean by, by success? So in the following, I'm going to present to you how CARE has addressed this challenge together with other key climate adaptation stakeholders. Um, as I said, there's a lot of different definitions of what community-based adaptation is. I'm just going to give you, a, a, you know, an explanation of what I know and where I used to come from. Um, within CARE, we based our community-based adaptations on four very interlinked issues, and it was essentially the interaction between these, these four elements um, that we call community-based adaptation. But fundamentally, community-based adaptation is about continually making choices in an uncertain climate. It's, it's about enabling climate-vulnerable communities to decide on and engage in development, livelihood, and risk management activities that are sustainable, climate resilient, and responsible to differential vulnerability within the community and broader land use and ecological systems. CARE's CBA framework provides a um, holistic analytical approach for communities to gain adaptive capacity and plan adaptive or adaptation actions that are informed by climate, climate science and local observation of climate change as well as an understanding of the increased risks and uncertainties that climate change brings. We argue, I say we still, I lived not that long time ago, but CARE argues that four key elements are required for successful adaptation at the community level. And each of these should be informed by climate analysis, climate risks, and the national policy context. And this is essentially the key elements that would separate what we call a climate adaptation program from, from a standard development program. So the four Elements for successful adaptation are one, you know, promotion of climate resilient livelihood strategies. And then we want to make sure that there is a correlation with disaster risk reduction strategies to, to essentially reduce the impacts of increased climate related natural disasters on these vulnerable communities. Then it's really important to also add capacity enhancement to the mix. And here you want to focus on community adaptive capacity such as in access to climate information and managing risk and uncertainty, and then also deal with the local civil society and government institutions to better support uh, communities and adaptation efforts. And that has a lot to do with that even though community is for and with, uh, or community-based adaptation is for and with communities, is not done in a vacuum and just within the confines of a given community. It's very much at the local level with whoever of the, the local stakeholders that are involved. So that leads me to the fourth point, which is the local and national level empowerment, uh, advocacy, and social mobilization that you need to essentially address the underlying causes of vulnerability, such as poor governance, gender-based inequality or resource use, or limited access to basic services, and then also to inf influence the policy and make environment. So adaptive planning or adaptation planning is all of these elements um, they are informed by the two different elements that you see here, climate change knowledge, but also risk and uncertainty, in addition to the range of information on local context conditions that you are able to, to generate. So community-based adaptation, um, excuse me just a second. Here. So, in response to the, to the growing climate adaptation program for, for portfolio within CARE, we realized that it was important to figure out whether or not we were actually succeeding in building this much needed resilience and adaptive capacity of our key target group, which is the climate vulnerable communities. And that doesn't, just doesn't um, only go for the, um, the climate portfolio, but it really is CARE's overall mandate. So as part of any planning and implementation process, you really need to answer questions like, is your support and approach is working? Um, who is it working for? But also how well are investments being used? And what is the value for money? Uh, because there's always an, an opportunity cost involved. Yet the challenge when you're dealing with climate, uh, climate adaptation programs is that they tend to be more complex than a standard development program. They generally involve not only a variety of actors, but also a variety of scales, timelines, and the context. 
And it's particularly at this very long time frame that we are dealing with uh, with relation to climate change that are challenging. So finally, the significant level of uncertainty associated with climate change also requires an emphasis on continuous learning and reflection to continuously update and modify climate adaptation programs and, and plans. So to address this challenge, CARE essentially commissioned IAD to help us out. Uh, we teamed up and as part of the design process, we also convened a cross-sectoral ex expert group um, that had representatives from a total of 10 NGOs, research organizations, and bilaterals. And you can see the, the list here, really great people. We wanted to essentially create a real participatory process and exchange among key organizations that are involved in, in CBA to tap into this really immense broader learning process that's related to ME for adaptation that has been steadily increasing in response to the increase of climate adaptation uh, programming. A former colleague of mine, um, Andy Desai, she was actually for a couple of years before this initiative, she was she was kind of managing or coordinating an informal working group on ME. So the PMO uh, initiative was very much based on, on that and I just want to give, give Angie credit for this. These discussions that we had in London, they were very lively and the PMO benefited greatly from these discussions. But what was really neat was that it was also a way to ensure that these other organizations also benefited um, from this exchange of ideas um, because we had a fairly narrow, narrow scope of the PMO. And a lot of the ideas that came out in London actually had a lot to do with how to upscale and upscale m and and how to take it to the next level because some of the organizations who invited were focusing a lot on, for instance, the national level and very much on the policy inputs that needs to go in. So a lot of the good points that came out of this discussion actually fit into to not just the PMO but also to, to other m and &E frameworks that are now uh, in full blaze out there, for instance, the learning to adapt and also IAD chose to take it forward in, in a TAMD framework, you know, the tracking adaptation monitoring development one. And Lucy is going to explain how the broader RCAP framework um, has taken essentially the PMO and taking it to the next level. So, but overall the outcome of, of this collaboration was the PMO manual for local adaptation practitioners and just to clarify PMO stands for participatory monitoring, evaluation, reflection and learning. The purpose of the PMO was to create a participatory m and &E process for CPA that <clears throat> on one could measure changes in adaptive capacity by supporting sustainable knowledge generation systems. And that is the overall most important part of this framework um, because that is the key goal with, with promoting climate adaptation and therefore we needed to know whether we were actually succeeding or not. But second, it was also, we also wanted to find a way to support adaptive management of CBA strategies and plans so that local stakeholders can continue adapting to the impacts of climate change just beyond the scope of a given CBA intervention. Um, CARE is very much a program-oriented organization, but we also realize that CBA is a continuous process that just won't stop just because the project stops. So we really wanted to empower communities to, to facilitate a continuous and a joint learning and reflection process. And this is particularly important for CBA to do this really high degree of, of uncertainty. But we also wanted to find a way to essentially from the bottom up feed into, should we say, meso and macro level information needs. And this is what something Lucy, she's going to use as her point of departure later today um, to essentially show you what the archive has done. But the, the point is that the PML is really creating the foundation of actually getting the information from the ground and then promoting it all the way up. So, in addition, CARE wanted a methodology that was designed as part of its larger strategy um, to empower women and, and other marginalized groups because that are very much um, um, CARE's key primary target group. And that means that it was really important for us that the PMED had to be non-extractive and contribute to continuous learning to action or for action by local uh, stakeholders and actually not just community members but also whoever were part of the, the local decision making process. So who is the PML process for? Um, when you read the PML manual, you will see that we essentially targeted three different types of groups. Um, 
the PMO framework um, can support a multi-stakeholder process, and I think it's really important because it was it was essentially intended for that because we realize the community-based adaptation, even though it tends to evolve around communities, there's a lot of different stakeholders that they depend on and, and involve in their decision-making process. So that said, it is first and foremost intended to be used for and by climate vulnerable communities themselves to support adaptive decision making. These communities refer to the poorest and most marginalized people living in regions that are vulnerable to climate change and who have low adaptive capacity. But I just want to highlight when you're talking about a community, community the whole word community is a, very, is a real social construct. So it's really important to unpack what this really means. And this is where CARE is using a climate vulnerability and capacity assessment to essentially differentiate or, or unpack what a community is, what are the different subgroups that, that make up the community, who is, who, who is vulnerable to what, because people are not, different, are, are not the same. So this involves uh, essentially both cross-section of stakeholders within the community, and here we're talking about both community leaders, but also different livelihood groups, women, elders, youth, and, and you name it. So the goal is for communities themselves to use the tool and manual to support their own continuous process and investigation and learning. And this result, uh, the result can be used to help inf you know, inform decision making at the community, but also at the household and individual level. And these results can also help community lobby for appropriate support, uh, support for effective adaptation. And this is something that's really interesting and important because what we do a lot is we try to make sure that community-based um, or community adaptation plans don't just remain within the confines of the community, but that they are integrated into the broader development process. So when you have a, a functioning m and &E system, it actually gives you ammunition to take it to, to the, the local decision makers and say, look, we know what we want to do and we're in charge of our own development, but we need your help to, to make it happen and we need your funding. Um, but due to the complexity of climate change and adaptation planning, uh, we also highly do recommend that the PMO process is initially facilitated or aided by project managers with an active involvement in the communities. It wouldn't, I, I'm not going to pretend that this PMO manual could just be taken up by a community and applied by itself. You know, you really need to provide some capacity first to, to, to make it happen. But eventually what we're hoping is that, that it can be taken forward. While the, the PMO framework is designed primarily to meet the learning and information needs of these communities, the, what is in, the information that emerges from the process is actually valuable for organizations supporting CBA. It helps because it helps them understand how effective CBA is. So we actually encourage very active involvement from other key stakeholders, such as representatives from local government, civil society, climate researchers, service providers, but also the private sector because it's the dynamics and the interaction between everybody that, that will really cause them the best results. In this way, the PMO process will benefit from the views and ideas from, from this mix of both practitioners, but also planners and policymakers across the field. And again, you really need that in order to feed whatever comes out of this process upwards in the system for, for, for proper policymaking. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> The overall PML strategy, we're now coming into unpacking the manual and, and the methodology as it is. Um, the overall PML strategy has five parts. Um, it provides a, a stepwise approach for participatory m and &E, uh, and that essentially includes guidance for how to design, how to do data collection, how to do analysis, and then finally how to actually implement this, this new system or, or process. It also links each steps back to the various steps of a standard program cycle and particularly the, the plan, planning process. I'll get into later where we, where we recommend that the PML is inserted into your general adaptation planning process. But in other words, there are five parts um, in developing an all, overall strategy for m and &E, and that has a lot to do with, first of course, you need to establish your, your PML team, who is going to be involved, who is going to take it forward. Then you design the ME plan, then you work on how to implement it, and then as part of that you have your data analysis, 
But what is really important is how you then have learning and reflection that will then lead to feedback and response and adjustment of especially your climate um, or your, your community adaptation plan, but also the ME system per se. And what you can see to the right in the slide is that you have this learning loop that we're trying to encourage. Um, what I will do from here on after in the presentation is that I will focus on unpacking part two, in other words, how you design the m and &E plan, because we don't have uh, unlimited time, and I spent five full days <laughs> uh, facilitating a, a training workshop in Nepal on, on how to do, um, do the whole strategy, so I'm not going to try to pretend I can cover every aspect of this in, in the time we have here. Um, but what is really important is that the reason why I want to start with part two is that, in other words, the design of the, of the strategy is that that, in my view, really is the heart of the PMO methodology. Because this is where you decide on the outcomes, the indicators, the baselines, and how you will go about monitoring them and evaluating these. So part two, deciding the, the PML m and &E plan and process consists of, of five steps. Um, and please note that I have swapped the order of step one and two uh, as they appear in the manual for the ones of you who actually read it um, as their um, and this is very much based on lessons learned from our initial field testing in, in, um, in Nepal. When we were writing the manual, Jessica Ayers and I, we were, we were really struggling with what comes first. And it was a little bit of a chicken and egg dis discussion. And when I then finally got a chance to apply it in, 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 in reality, I felt that it was really important that you first have very clear what is it you're trying to monitor, and then you essentially take it from there. But I just wanted to highlight part that. Um, so um, what you need to do in these five steps is that first you essentially decide what you want to monitor and measure. And then you want to map out who's going to be involved and the stakeholder information needs. Uh, and then based on that, what we've started doing in, in, the, in, in should we say, operationalizing this methodology is to create a community visualization process that you carry out during this step two, and um, and then you use step three to define the, the, the indicators. And then step four, you define and measure the baseline, and in step five, you finalize the PML uh, m and &E plan um, by essentially fleshing out the different activities, but also you need to budget it and, and allocate resources for it. So what is the first step in, in, um, in actually designing an m and &E? Um, plan. Uh, we start by returning to one of the fundamental questions I posed earlier in this present presentation, and that is, what do we need to measure to, to verify whether community-based adaptation interventions are effective? The PML methodology uh, seeks to provide robust, reliable information to essentially respond to the following four questions. Are we doing the right activities? And this question encourages a continual reassessment of whether activities are the right ones. For example, are we prioritizing the right activities to achieve our desired outcomes? Um, can we measure any changes in the adaptive capacity of the community members? Have there been any changes to the context that mean adjustments in activities or even assumptions or, object, um, or objectives are required? And these are very fundamental questions to keep in mind. But it's not just enough to know that you're actually doing the right activities because all roads lead to Rome. You know, you can actually do something in a lot of different ways. So we also need to ask ourselves, are we doing the activity the right way? And the focus here is to understand how implementation can be improved to reach critical social groups, reduce costs, and improve sustainability. For example, is the CBA activities reaching the most vulnerable groups? Does, does the target group change over time? Because we are living in a very dynamic and, and, and volatile time. Are inventions using resources is, uh, effectively, or could they be used more effectively? And then are the interventions supporting people to adapt them, enabling people to make tangible and lasting changes in their, um, in their adaptive capacity? Or, God forbid, are we actually encouraging something like, like maladaptation? Then there's the whole issue of scale. So are we actually doing, let's say we're doing the right things and, the, and in the right way, but are we actually reaching the right scale? 
For example, are we achieving multiple changes at multiple levels so as to allow sustainability? Or does the CBA initiative address larger scale constraints on adaptive capacity, for instance, government barriers or institutional barriers? that would either hinder or enable long-term adaptive capacity. And this is really important. And I, I can already say now that we have already come up across some limitations with our methodology, which is something that Lucy will, will elaborate on in, in her presentation, because that's something that the, the RCAP system is addressing. So the final question are, are the CBA achievements actually matching expectations? Excuse me. And that has a lot to do with answering the question, or if we answer this question, it actually helps track activities and monitor progress against the objectives in the community-based adaptation plans. It also helps ensure accountability, not just to the stakeholders involved, but also to practitioners and managers and donors that are involved, and that are looking at how CBA is being undertaken, uh, undertaken and how resources are being used. We feel that by focusing on learning, that the PML encourages us to ask if why and how CBA initiatives are staying on track, and, and we are strongly believe in, in that process. So to respond to these four questions, the PMO focuses on three types of information. The first type of information essentially concerns process and practice, and, and for me that has a lot to do with what I call standard monitoring and evaluation that you see a lot in results-based frameworks and whatnot. This concerns information on how the CBA interventions are being implemented, you know, the progress made. It means monitoring and evaluation the progress uh, of implementation of the community as adaptation plans and essentially getting a better idea of what is working and what isn't and particularly why that is. So by tracking practice, we can see how practices and, um, and requirements change over time in response to a changing climate and other risk. And that has a lot to do with holding it up with the information that we get from the context that I will get back to later. Such feedback should allow us to work with communities on continuously updating the adaptation plans against the changing climate because they cannot be stagnant because the, 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 the environment and the context are continuously changing. So the second type of information concerns outcomes and here we essentially need to assess the impact stemming from whatever we are trying to implement with the adaptation plans. It concerns information on change to the vulnerability and adaptive capacity of different groups at the community level because if we actually don't see a change, we are not uh, accomplishing what, what we set out to do. The third and final type of information concerns context and I can't highlight how important this one is because it's imperative to also monitor and evaluate the continuously changing context within which people are adapting. This concerns both changes in climate, but also in other contextual factors such as changes in, in food prices and governance, because they are also drivers of vulnerability and very much some of the underlying causes to, uh, to not just vulnerability but also to poverty. So by tracking changes in both climate and other drivers of vulnerability and assessing changes in adapting practices and outcomes in light of these contextual changes, we can test how robust our strategies are as, as actual adaptation strategies, climate and other risks. So it's not just measuring these three different levels of types of information and isolation, it's very much looking at whatever comes out of those and, and holding them up uh, against each other to, to see where they are. And very importantly, if for whatever reason we have embarked on maladaptation, hopefully this type of, of monitoring will also help us detect that. The second step is to, uh, so in other words, after you know what you want to measure, you need to figure out who needs to, who needs what type of information. And this brings us to the second step of the PMO m &E plan. And this is where you essentially map the stakeholder information needs. Yet before you can identify the information needs, you first need to figure out who should be involved. In other words, who are the stakeholders that, that we want to engage? And also what are their roles? Because they can be more or less proactive, they can be engaged at different levels, they can be in, engaged in different stages of the processes, and it's something you have to be, be clear in your mind about. And then also, what is their capacity? Do they have the necessary capacity, but also do they actually have the real interest to be involved, and, and if what, how can we then uh, find a way to get them actively engaged? 
Then you need to identify the specific information needs. To do this, you need to ask yourself the following questions. What information needs need to be gathered? Who is, uh, how is this gathered? When are you going to go about it? How is it recorded? And that has a lot to do with type of what type of data you're dealing with, but also, very importantly, how is it going to be prioritized? The PML manual provides specific tools that can assist in all these processes. And if you look in, in the whole part three of the manual, there's a ton of different tools. And unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into those, but I, I really I encourage you to, to examine them. And, and I'll be more than happy to respond to, to questions you might have. So I'll provide you with my email at the end. In addition, most climate adaptation programs involve a risk, a climate risk and vulnerability assessment. And I'm highlighting this because in CARES CVCA, uh, in CARES Climate Adaptation Program, uh, the CVCA is actually a fundamental, of almost like a mandatory requirement. Um, and this essentially provides a lot of the necessary information that you need to carry out this particular step. Um, for instance, the CVCA gives you a very detailed situation analysis of what are the livelihoods we are dealing with, what is the situation with the specific climate shocks and stresses against the different types of ecosystems we are working in? What are the ecosystems that we are operating in? And what is, what's the whole governance structure around that we are, are, are dealing with? It also provides detailed information about um, the community profiling. In other words, it refers back to what I was saying earlier, that what is a community? And we need to unpack it and figure out what are the different households and people and interests in that constitute this particular community. And then finally, it gives a dis disaggregated or very differential picture of what the vulnerability is among all these different subgroups and, and people within the community. Um, yeah. So, in other words, a CVCA or any type of climate vulnerability analysis will provide you a very good point of departure for the, the PMO process. What we did as part of our, one of the first places where we field tested the PMO uh, was in Nepal. And we actually applied it first wholeheartedly with one program, the How Do You Ban program in Nepal, but then also with a couple of other programs, including the Chuli program. And what I did there was that we were kind of testing different ways of, of applying it. But what we realized was that to help map the necessary information needs, it's actually a really good idea to carry out a community visualization, as I call it, um, for high adaptive capacity. There's some guidance in the manual on how to go about it. And then what we did in the poll is that we actually really fleshed out that, that process. The community vision uh, process built on the CVCA. So in other words, that's your starting point. So you have a really good idea before you do that CVCA on you know what are the what are the different what are the different asset base that the community has available? What are the vulnerabilities and, and what are they up against in terms of past and, and present climate change and vulnerability? But what I found personally from a lot of the field work I've done is that when you do a CVCA, a lot of times you leave behind this real doom and gloom picture, and it's hard. It's really difficult. It's really you know, it's so easy to create the sense of despair that, oh my God, you know, I'm already up Shit's Creek and it's only going to get worse. Excuse me, my language. But so what we wanted to do with with uh, this visioning exercise is that we took some of the principles from positive visualization and essentially said, let's forget about the cavalry. What if the cavalry is not coming? Because sometimes, unfortunately, it just isn't. We can't just sit here and wait for, for someone to come and rescue us. So we need to figure out how we apply whatever we have at our, 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 at our availability to the best possible use. And it essentially means that you take some of this, these challenges that the CVCA is highlighting and takes it to the next level and kind of twist it around. So when you do this type of positive visualization, it's a very effective tool, tool to essentially empower communities to take command of the future and because they they seem to get an opportunity to decide for themselves how they wish their community and their future to be but on their own terms. And that leads back a little bit to the question I posed up front is like who is it who's going to def to define what success really means? You know, we can come in from the outside to a poor community and say, you know, we think that you should be doing X, Y, C. But at the end of the day, we never really fully understand all the dynamics and the complexities there. And a lot of times, they have very different priorities. So it's important to bring that to the forefront. 
also when you do this type of, of visualization you actually it enables you to create a collective ideal vision for the whole entire community on what they would like their, view, their, their community vision to look like. They, they each have their contributions to make to it and then you essentially compile it and collate it into one particular vision. And that means that it can actually help them envision you know, what, what their future would look like if there were absolutely no constraints and that they have this very high adaptive capacity and then it's a lot easier to then introduce some of the challenges afterwards because then you know what you want and then you say okay well let's find a way to attack these barriers and constraints that we are against. Um, what is also interesting that you don't necessarily just have to invite the community members. What we benefited from was to actually draw in some of the local government officials and, and some service providers and help them be part of this process because it gives them a much better idea of where the communities are coming from. And it also helped create a sense of that not everybody had the same vision. So when you put these community members and all their, their different uh, stakeholders and, and partners together, they get a much better idea of what the, what the combined ideas are and then you pull the resources and figure out how to take it from there. Um, so Since this vision exercise provides the foundation for, for, for a future community adaptation plan because what you do is you create your vision and then these particular outcomes that you come up with, you essentially start working back from them. Um, yeah. What I recommend you do is um, we use a facilitator to essentially guide this particular vision exercise and it essentially ensures that when you do your, your homework you have a script that you read from when, when you guide them through this dreaming exercise and you essentially that way can somehow ensure that you cover key aspects that are important for the well-being of both people but also the, the ecosystems that, that are supporting them. And when you're talking about community well-being, it really has a lot to do with, should we say, basic resources. So in other words, the assets, the water resources and energy, forests and biodiversity ecosystems, the livelihoods, especially agriculture, but everything that helps uh, secure food security. But also health and safety is really important. And then you have the human settlements and the infrastructure because infrastructure can, can really be a barrier towards adaptation. And then Finally, it's really, really, really important to look at governance, uh, not just uh, governmental structures, but also what are the gender uh, dynamics, what's the social capital and all the cultural dynamics going on. So what you do here is that each participant writes and draw uh, specific vision outcome statements based on the visualization, what they saw. And then you essentially combine all these different statements into one community vision. And then to move the PMO process further, these statements are then used to, first of all, create the joint vision that you then have, that's your goal. But then based on that, uh, you can essentially elaborate your community adaptation plan where you're leaning on, on the results from the climate vulnerability and, and capacity assessment. You have your community vision at hand and then you essentially work your way backwards from the outcomes that you're envisioning and flesh them out in terms of, of activities. Um, Tina, I want to uh, give you a 10-minute uh, uh, alarm. Yeah. So 10 more minutes. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dennis. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into details here with the overall process, but what you do with these outcome statements is that you, through a combination of a theory of change and a participatory scenario planning, you essentially create domains of change to guide the outcome development and prioritization. And then based on that, you work your way backwards um, um, to essentially develop your baseline and your indicators. And you know, if you're interested in the Q&A session, I can go into, into how we actually did that. But the baseline is essentially, if you envision what you would like to have, a lot of times that is what you don't have right now. So you then have discussions about if this is what you want, well then what is the current status quo and based on that you develop your baseline. And then you develop indicators and, and milestones as part of where how do you get from point A to point B. Then the last step is to um, budget and allocate your resources. You flesh it out in, in a document and here 
it's important to include the outcomes to be achieved, the, the characteristics to be measured, the time interval between measurements, and especially the spatial coverage as well. And information needs to be documented in a way that will reach a wide number of stakeholders is, is outlined in the, um, in the manual. It's also very important to think about criteria that can be used to check the suitability of the plan. Um, and guidance is provided in the manual as well. And then you need to budget um, the M&E plan, because if you don't have the proper resources, it, it's just going to be wishful thinking. So that is very much based on an assessment uh, of costing of each activity. And then you need to ensure that each element of the M&E plan is, is costed, uh, and that essentially include undertaking or looking at what can be carried out on a voluntary basis and what will have to be uh, financially compensated. And when you do it this way, you essentially ensure um, transparency. Now, um, what has Kent done so far to turn this theory into practice? Uh, and as stated earlier, uh, the PMO methodology is very much a learning by doing process. And as such, um, uh, the PMO methodology is very much considered a living document. And therefore, it will be continuously updated to respond to, to recommendations from, from field testing and from everybody who's engaged in it. So as part of this continued learning process, CARE starts to roll it out within its own climate adaptation portfolio using a, a stepwise approach. And the objective is essentially to um, field test it or road test it by first uh, field testing it in um, in a few country offices and, and country programs. And then based on that, and the feedback and the lessons learned to fine tune the methodology before there's a broader rollout. What we did was that last year we um, facilitated, I say we, that was CARE, facilitated a training of trainers workshop um, for the Nepal Hadi Ban program in Nepal. And that's a, a collaboration between um, the WWF, uh, uh, CARE, FECO Fund, and, and NTNC. And there was about 29 participants, both from departments, government departments, uh, regional directors, forest officers, and, and also a bunch of people from the, the four program partners involved. What was astounding was that based on this training of trainers, they actually went out and trained about 100 local resource persons from community forest user groups um, that then took it forward in their, in their, should we say, priority landscapes. And at this point, the PMO has essentially incorporated uh, PMO into 40 community adaptation plans. And they're in the process of evaluating how that, that goes. Um, CARE is also very open, uh, open for business in terms of field testing the, this methodology with strategic partners in larger consortia. And um, CARE, CARE very much hopes that other institutions will be interested in either working with CARE to field test this, or even taking parts of the methodology and doing it on their own. Um, but what the care would really appreciate is that they then feed back the, the lessons learned to care and acknowledge the, the intellectual property right of care as part of their, their field testing process. Um, I can also share what I haven't put here is that care very much hope to convene a workshop next year to essentially invite people who've been involved in the field testing of the workshop to have an open brainstorming and, and workshop essentially on how to revise and fine tune the methodology and take it forward. So anybody who would be interested in that, I encourage you to, to get in touch with, with CARE. And then there are plans about how to also test the, the PML as part of the, the broader RCAP framework, and this is something that, that Lucy is going to elaborate on after this, um, uh, this as part of the, the second part of this webinar. So. I just want to roll up a bit here, and the benefits of PML is essentially that it provides a methodology to generate evidence on the effectiveness of CBA. And it encourages a multi-stakeholder approach, but fundamentally communities are targeted um, as the, the key audience. Then while um, it, it's essentially very participatory, and also what it really does promote is a very non-extractive nature, nature, so instead of researchers or program directors or, or program people coming in, having some meetings, taking information, going back and then, then digesting it far and then bringing it back to the communities. 
the communities are very much in the driver's seat of the process and what we are hoping it will do is to help support a strong local ownership and also a more active engagement in M&E because if you engage in M&E you are actually also pro essentially per se by that act actively engaging in the overall CBA process and it helps convert data and information into new knowledge and insights, which is very, very important. And there's a lot of flexibility within this approach. And what I also really like about this methodology, uh, something that Jess and I talked a lot about when we developed it, was the importance of not only looking at climate drivers of vulnerability, because climate adaptation is really much done within a broader development context. And it's really important to consider a broader non-climate drivers of vulnerability, such as fluctuations in market prices and changes in governance. And then what it does, it, it supports a very bottom-up, flexible and targeted approach to climate adaptation planning. And what I do think it will actually do, I hope it will do, is it's a contributing factor to increase community resilience and adaptive capacity because the fact that you're emphasizing reflection on learning actually help promote uh, changes in whatever ad ad adaptation activities that needs to happen. While there are many positive aspects of the PMO methodology, I'm not going to lie, it has some, some very clear uh, limitations. For example, the emphasis on, on participatory processes also means that much of the information generated will be subjective. Um, and designed to meet the needs of, of specific um, target groups. But then again, you can argue how objective is the standard and the needs system really when it comes to it, but we can, we can take that up in the discussion. But the good news here is that this limitation is being addressed by the RCAP team, and Lucy, she will elaborate on that in, in part two. And then another thing is, what I want to highlight here is, um, the whole issue of payment, um, no, participation is, is actually costly both in terms of time and money. And at the end of the day, you are up against a certain reality and you really need to have an idea of what are the resources you have available before you embark on this. Uh, how much time do you have available and how much money do you have? And then essentially based on that, you can determine how participatory you want to be. Um, instead of going necessarily for the full hawk. But luckily there there is um there's a span, there's a continuum that you feel can work within. Then based on some work I've done here in Canada with First Nations and Indigenous communities, one of the things I think is really important to keep in mind is that there's also a whole issue of payment. Um, a lot of times we can't just necessarily assume that, that community members will want to participate for free because they may not be able to want to participate without being financially compensated or they may actually not be able to afford it because there's an opportunity cost involved. A lot of times when we do do consultations and, and do do um, community-based exercise in the community, you know, people have to take time away from from their livelihoods and it's actually it's it's a very important decision for them to make. Then finally I just want to highlight that there's the, the scope of the process. Again that the primary focus is on at the community level and that actually leads me into the segue to to where Lucy is going to go with, with her presentation. Um, while the PMO methodology supports um, a multi-stakeholder participatory in the process, it very much focuses at the community level. What we do is that we generate domains and, and indicators that are for the communities and defined by communities, and then the community learning is about feedback into the community adaptation plans. But we also recognize that if you only have community adaptation or community-based adaptation that are these isolated communities here and there, if you don't find a way to aggregate them and essentially scale up and scale up, you're never going to reach a more transformed adaptive capacity and resilience. And this is something that the RCAP team has taken on board. Um, so Lucy, what she will do is she will present how the ME, uh, how the RCAP program has used the, the PMO as a foundation to add these additional layers to address this need for, for such multi-scale and mini approach. And I really do hope you'll be able to participate in this part two of our joint webinar because I think it will be really worth your, your time. Um, that's it for me. I don't know if I managed to hold it within time, but I just want to provide you with 
first of all, here's my details, and I would be more than happy to respond to whatever questions you have. Um, there's a lot of things I would have loved to, to elaborate on more, um, and feel free to email me, uh, because this is work that I'm involved in on a, on a regular basis, and I uh, something that's really close to my, my heart. And it's very much a work in progress, and I, I myself have a lot of questions, so feel free to, to get in touch. But I also just want to show you where you can actually um, get a hold of the penal manual. I think Dennis will ensure it, it's uploaded on the Sea Change uh, site as well. And if you want to re reach out to some of the key care contacts on this, um, there's Kit Bond, who's the director for the Pekin Secretariat. Carl Deering is another uh, person who's been very much involved in the PMO. And then Suni Nuregni is my dear colleague from the Nepal uh, Haryobank program. He is the planet adaptation coordinator for that program. And I'm sure he can give you some valuable insights on what it actually means to field test this. That's it. Thank you very much, Hello. Tina. Thank you. That was uh, that was very good on time. Thank you, and very interesting as well. And having said that, I'm going to take back the screen, and I want to uh, open the floor for uh, people asking questions. And having said that, I um, already have a first question myself, which uh, came up um, in our. Uh, testing for this webinar and also in a webinar I did yesterday with the Sustainable Development and Policy Institute in Pakistan that was a there was a closed webinar in which uh, we basically did an online training of one and a half hours on uh, some interesting questions on, on m and not particularly focusing on adaptation but there the, the, the question was with respect to participation and we came to the discussion that a fundamental element of m e is to create ownership of the of the whole m e process mm -hmm. and then the discussion went to towards the question does participation does active involvement of beneficiaries necessarily create ownership and i was wondering tina what your what your ideas are about that <laughs> You knew you knew this one was coming. <laughs> yeah. No, you had warned me about this particular one, but um, I, I think it's a really good question, um, and I actually I, I think it will stand the test of time. Um, I think what we're trying to do with the PMO is to essentially create empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, but in my view, participation. What does what but what does participation mean? Does it mean to invite people into a room and then just because they're present, they are participating? If, if they are not given a voice, and if they are not heard, and if they, they don't feel taken seriously, and if they are not seen, they are most likely going to have a sense that, well, you know, my, my view really doesn't matter, and then they are going to disengage from the process. So I think in order to create ownership, you have to do whatever you can to work, to really hear people. Mm -hmm. and to create a different fora where people feel safe, especially because we are working with very poor and vulnerable communities. And, and I can't stress that enough because when I was trying, when I was working on this methodology, one of the things you struggle with is when you're out in the community, sometimes some of the people we're dealing with, they can't even read and write, but they have a world of wisdom and a world of knowledge. And just because they can't read and write, it doesn't mean they don't have anything to contribute. So you have to find a way to break down, for instance, in a community, a lot of times men, men can read and write, and sometimes kids can read and write. But it's generally the women who can't because they are kept out of the school system. Mm -hmm. So what I do when I go into a community like this, I say, we want to do the same type of exercises, but we carry them out in different ways. And I also break a community into focus groups so that you, you create a sense of safety and freedom uh, for people who normally don't speak up to actually feel safe enough to, to voice it. And I have been blessed to be part of processes where people really have done that. And I have seen community dynamics where you suddenly have a woman standing up in front of a whole community, something she's never done before, and she presents what came out of their focus group, and the men are just in awe. And in Guatemala, at some point, one man came up and kind of gave his wife a big hug and a kiss and said, that's my wife, you know? And it's just something like this, that if you find a way 
to go into a community like this without having all the answers prepared in advance and really say, how do we create a safe space for people mm-hmm. to actually participate? But I also, ownership, you know, if, if going back to this whole issue of cost, you know, sometimes what I've seen is if you're not in a position to actually pay people for the time, a lot of times they're going to say, well, you're making big bucks for being involved in this process, and then I'm not getting any, getting any payment for my money, so for my, for my valuable time here, so why should I be involved? And I think it's important to be really realistic as what is it we're asking people to do, mm-hmm. and then respect that. And then really try to take that into consideration, and I think that will help create ownership. I I have to agree with that one because people have their particular opportunity cost as well, which we which we can't forget about. Um, um, t- I'm going to take two questions together, which both have to do with interaction with um, with um, government officials in some way or the other. Um, the first one is from Yves Laurent, and the question is, do communities advocate to get buy-in from local authorities for their vision, their outcome level ideas? And the second question is from Dan- Daniela Tarizo, which is, does the tool enable effective policy impact? How are the good practices being leveraged to influence policy making? And I'm guessing that would, given the scope of um, project and program M&E, also be on a, on a sub-national level. Sure. Okay. You know, what we do, I say we, but at least what we did when, when I was still a care, but also what I'm doing here in Canada with, with some First Nations, is that we never carry out these processes just with, with community members on their own. Mm-hmm. We really try to get a look at what are the complexity in terms of stakeholders involved in a given area. So we're talking about local, local government officials, you know, service providers, is are there any private sector people involved, are there any you know, civil society people, in other words, NGOs that are providing support, are there any other projects involved? Sometimes we invite programs from, from that are doing different things, but providing certain services to, to a, a community as well. And it's when you get that, that different constellation of people that you actually have very interesting dynamics and, and discussions going on. Um, so to that extent, I would say that there's definitely an interaction, but again, it's really about all depending on how vocal these 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 communities are if they are comfortable with people if there's a trust level that's already established you can have some very lively discussions but sometimes you've got to work a little harder to make sure that that people are not just saying what they think you want to hear mm-hmm. you really want to make sure that you create a sense of space where people say what they actually really mean and sometimes that takes some extra work mm-hmm. Um, I have been involved with some communities that were very verbal and very, very vocal towards community or, 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 or should we say, the, the government officials involved. But a lot of times it's, it's something that takes time. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you build the confidence over time as part of the process. And, and especially if you use a, a CBCA of time vulnerability analysis to really build, have the same stakeholders involved in that process, then people are not new when you come into the m and process. Mm-hmm. Then they already know each other and they are used to kind of banter and, and you kind of know who you need to nudge and who you need to give a little bit of space and, and, and that helps. And then to get back to Danielle's, uh, Daniela's question, um, Daniela, I hope you will be able to, uh, you must be really tired if you're in, if it's 3 a.m. in the morning at your time, but I hope you can participate in Lucy's um, webinar as well because she will show how we are essentially building on the PMO by adding three different additional layers on that with the RCAP team. But even just with the PMO, you know, I can't stress enough how important it is to realize the community-based adaptation, even though it's for communities and with communities, you're not just working within a geographical conference of a community space. A lot of times the community is within a broader landscape. And that means that you can have the PMO process in a landscape where you have different communities upstream and downstream involved and like the visioning exercise I was referring to what care Vietnam did in a big project where that's that they did it for a whole watershed so I don't you know for me these processes can be upscale not necessarily all the way to the national level but at least to a level where you start having some leverage in terms of providing inputs to the to the policy dialogue Mm-hmm. Because what is so important is to get these community adaptation plans. Not uh, you don't want to have a standalone plan. You want to make sure that that is fully integrated into the broader development process. 
and then you essentially make sure that whatever recommendations you get from that is, is then communicated from the bottom up, yes, but all, all the way up through the system. And, mm -hmm. and that essentially is something, well, in that sense, CARE has been is a knowledge broker in that particular sense. But um, it really has a lot to do with how, like for instance in Nepal, you have these community forced user groups and they are, they are immensely active at the policy level. They are very, very active and, and very, very powerful at the national level because they've gotten themselves organized. So if you have these community user groups for whatever livelihood you have and you get them organized and then they manage to represent the port of all, that's when you can start having some real impact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I see some more questions coming in and I'll take two questions together that come from Sunil Kumar. And his first question is, um, when you look at adaptation programs, um, they quite often look at, at ecosystem vulnerability as much as um, community level vulnerability. Um, when you look at ecosystems, there are often issues upstream and downstream of the ecosystem. Um, in, in what way can CBA be linked with adaptation actions at other levels upstream and downstream, both in the ecosystem and project-wise, and I think project-wise that links quite a bit towards the RCAP method that will be discussed in six hours from now. Yeah. Uh, a second question is, what is the biggest difference between PMURL and regular project monitoring systems? Hmm. Okay, two very different questions. So let's start with the first one. Well, so you happen to be my, my former colleague, and we were working very closely together in, in Nepal on the How You Bound program, and he's essentially the one who's taking the PMO forward within the How You Bound program. Um, so it's a bit of a <laughs> loaded question, <laughs> because what we actually did when we were in Nepal was that um, we realized when we were going through the manual and we had the train the trainer's workshop that because the How You Bound program, it's a, it's a, a consortium of you know, WWF, that's, that's a conservation organization, here that's a humanitarian development organization, and then you have two local Nepali co uh, partner organizations where one is development and the other one is the conservation organization as well. So everything we do in that program is a combination of looking at the dynamics, the, the co-benefits and the trade-offs between conservation aspects and development aspects. Mm -hmm. So what we actually did already there with the PMO where we, we tore it apart and then instead of looking just at community-based adaptation, we actually called it local-based adaptation and very much looked at the ecosystem dynamics and integrated the ecosystem angle by also looking at ecosystem services and benefits as part of the, the whole package. And I, I can't agree enough with Sunil that, that in the second iteration of, of the manual, we should definitely make sure that that there's a much stronger ecosystem angle reflected in it because I think that it would benefit immensely from that. I have I spent 18 years working on, on environment and conservation before joined CARE, so <laughs> it's you're speaking to the converter, but it's uh, it's it's very much a learning in progress. And but what you what you enter into when you're dealing both with should we say the political boundaries that are constituted by a province or a district or, or community boundaries versus when you're dealing with ecosystems where you have these ecological boundaries, they are very, very different, very, they're very rare that they overlap. So it adds some complexity to, to these dynamics that we're dealing with. But what we are discussing in Nepal was that if you're actually taking, for instance, a watershed approach, mm -hmm. and you're looking at the geographical, or at, at the ecological boundaries of this, this watershed, and then you're looking at what communities do we have within this watershed and how do we look at upstream downstream mechanism you can easily apply them the, the PMO methodology to that you do it in groupings and then you get representatives from the different teams to get together and then you kind of you know aggregate the findings that you're coming out with in the, the community ones um, so so that's what I would do but coming back to that I would say that Actually, what what the RCAP team is doing because they have have very specific CBA sites. It's a consortium of, of nine different INGO partners that are working together in Bangladesh, and it's existing 
project sites of these these NGO partners that are being used for the ARCA activities. And then what they're doing is, I say they, I'm going to be part of it, but we're probably going to apply the, 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 the broader RCAT methodology there and essentially aggregate the separate community PML findings into a, uh, an aggregate whole and then lift um, the findings up through some, some specific indicators. Would you mind repeating the second question? That was something about the difference between um, CBA and, and development, right? No, the, the question is how is the PMURL approach different from, what are the biggest differences from regular project monitoring systems? Okay. Um, when, I don't know if there is such a thing as, as regular project monitoring. Yeah. But, you know, I, I used to design GF projects for, for a living, and as part of that, you you design what we call results-based frameworks, where you have your, your inputs and your outputs and your outcomes, and you're looking at your process indicators, and, and it's very, very schematic, and it's very logical, so to speak. It's one step leads to the other. When, when we are dealing with the PMO, what we are recommending here is actually more of a theory of change process because you're looking at different pathways and what they can lead to because you need to look at different climate scenarios because you don't know for a fact what's going to happen so you have no choice but to work with plan A, B and C for instance and in order for you to do that you need to have these different pathways and, and a theory of practice or a theory of change process will, will essentially enable you to do that. And Lucy is going to spend a lot of time uh, later today talking about that, how you go about that. Then what we did within CARE was that we merged that with what we call a participatory scenario planning, which is very much taking you know, the results you gain from your climate vulnerability analysis and then looking into the future by looking at different climate scenarios and then working backwards, but also considering some of these other uh, drivers of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, so the difference here very much is that um, I would say when you're dealing with CBA, you're dealing with much longer time frames. Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of times you're dealing with a continuous process. So when you have a development process, a lot of times you, know, you have a finite process when the project ends, that's it. It shouldn't necessarily be the, that way, but a lot of times that happens. When you're dealing with climate adaptation, it is so profoundly more important that you continue the process beyond the, 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 the lifespan of the program and an intervention because you have this continuous change and uncertainty that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So climate adaptation is very much about behavioral change more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're trying to measure. Right? So in other words, are we succeeding in building adaptive capacity? Yes or no? And then of course, you know, under that you can have the standard things, you know, you know have you made any changes in, in, in capacity, this, that, and the other, but whenever you're talking about indicators for the work we are doing, it's very much indicators related to knowledge, um, to capacity, and also to the practice, mm -hmm. if you really want to capture what you're doing. Uh, sticking to beyond the timeline of the project, which you, which you just uh, touched upon a little bit, um, how um, do you sustain the m and &E of CBA after the project timeline and related to that, how realistic uh, has it been for PMURL to attribute outcomes uh, to the specific interventions other than direct outputs? Well, two good questions. I would say, to, to answer the first one, how do you sustain it? I would say the more ownership you can create about a process, the more likelihood there is that you will sustain it. But as I, as I also uh, alluded to in when I was talking about the limitation, there is such a thing as money. And if you can't fund the activities, like for instance, people can have all the willingness in the world to be involved in the process, but what if it costs certain money to generate the data and the information that you need to, to, to feed into the system? What are you going to do? So the whole point is that sometimes I feel that we're almost trying to oversimplify the PMO process, but on the other hand, by trying to keep it simple, there is actually a chance that whatever you're doing is not going to cost a whole lot, and you will develop indicators there that are very locally specific, you'll develop indicators that's based on information and data that's already existing, so you don't have to spend money generating new ones. So all these factors are, are essentially coming together to ensure, or not ensure, but hopefully, should mm -hmm. we say, enable 
that a process will, will sustain itself. But a lot of this is still very hypothetical because we really haven't, we don't have the experience yet. I'm not mm -hmm. going to lie. Mm -hmm. We are just rolling it up. Right? Uh, so we are crawling. We, we are not walking yet. Mm -hmm. um, Sola from Nigeria also wanted you to elaborate a little bit more on the role of incentives uh, in making community participation effective. And he was wondering if that's a normal practice within your work. Hmm. <laughs> well, it, it, incentives is, is a big word, you know, of course yeah. there's the monetary incentives and then there's the non-monetary ones. Um, uh, before I joined CARE, uh, I used to work for the UN system and I was based in Cambodia for three years I was um, heading up their environment department and at the time when I was there that was in 99 to 2002 um, we had a very unique situation in that at that time Cambodia was the only country in the world where mm. the UN system was allowed to pay for government involvement we had actually come up with and that was the whole UN system widely had come up with a, should we say per diem payment where we could pay government officials to attend meetings and that was in recognition of the fact that there not only was a very low capacity at the time but that the local government salaries or the government salaries at the time were so low that in order for them to show up at a meeting and be participating or participate in a workshop or whatever there was a very significant opportunity cost involved in it for them that system, I don't think that is still the case, mm -hmm. um, because it goes without saying that it actually led to all sorts of, of, of abuse and whatnot. But I think it actually raised a very important question, and that is, you know, when you are asking someone to participate, to show up and participate in something, and you're actually asking for their inputs and time, and really invest themselves in the time, why should they do that for free? And especially, why should it do it for free if it means that they are losing something else? In other words, if someone has to spend one full day in, in, in a, a meeting doing a, a, or doing a, a community visualization with me, and that means that that person is going to use like a day's worth of income, you know, isn't it fair that that person is compensated to, to be where I want that person to be instead of doing what that person should be doing? And I think it's something we need to, to be honest about. I, I may raise on something very controversial here, but what, why should my time be more mad valuable than somebody else's? But on the other hand, if, if somebody can see a true benefit to participating in something, and they can see that it will help improve their livelihoods and improve their lives as a whole, that's a different matter. Then people might say, you know what, I don't mind being invested in this. I'm doing mm -hmm. for bone, for instance, right now, mm -hmm. for certain things because I, I, it matters to me. And sometimes if something matters enough to us, we are willing to actually give our time for free. But I, I think we just need to... I, I think the, the, the fact of that we can give time for free is, is a luxury as well to some of us. Um, yes. It's not something we can just openly ask from people and expect that they do it. it. What I want to say is that it doesn't show a lack of interest if people would not show up without payment. It, it shows that maybe uh, there are things like sustain their livelihoods that are more important to them than involvement and and that's something that we have to have to respect and having said that we, f we fly in consultants um, with tickets of 1500 US dollars at a daily rate of 500 plus US dollars and we we can't pay local participants 10 or 15 dollars or five dollars and, and and a lunch because that's what we're talking about we're not talking here about uh, thousands of dollars we're talking about yeah. peanuts on the size of a project um, so in that sense I think it's 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 something that needs to be discussed carefully because there is quite a big space as well uh, for corruption in that sense people showing up just for the sake of getting five dollars without any participation people showing up that don't have anything to do with the community and with that also margin people being marginalized because there is uh, five dollars to be gained so it's something that needs to be looked at very carefully but it is not something that we should just dismiss no like for instance in Cambodia what we did if say we had a three or four day workshop people would never get their per diem until the end of the workshop and only if they had participated in all the days 
So mm-hmm. we, can, we had to keep records on who was showing up and why they were there. And we only let people in who were on the list of participants. Mm-hmm. And we had we had established quite transparent rules about you know how you engage and and what it would take so that we could say, well you know according to the rules and regulations this is how it's going to be. Mm-hmm. But it's I'm not saying that was necessarily the best best should we say solution to to um, an important problem. But I, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, but I think that things like providing lunches and providing transportation and and finding ways to maybe compensate people in, in ways that are not necessarily mon- monetary mm-hmm. can can be important and there's all sorts of ways of going about it but it's something that has to be transparent and something that has to be part of the, the discussion of doing this work mm-hmm. 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 Daniela says um, that uh, free is a price to pay for a common benefit that affects the community directly and community members understand the value of contributing to op- obtaining their own results um, and I, I have to agree with that as well there are double sides to, to this picture um, and, and volunteering does increase ownership um, at the same time that really depends on the context I, I wouldn't very quickly see um, volunteering and I wouldn't see volunte- volunteering increasing ownership in Cambodia um, and you're based there, right? like yeah I'm, I'm, I'm based here it might be different in in, in uh, Morocco or in um, West Africa um, but yeah I think it's something that you need to look at very very context uh, specific and but I also think an, an issue like social capital yeah. I think is really important to consider because if you have a very strong social cohesion within a community where people generally are okay with and used to pooling their resources in a communal manner, mm-hmm. then you might actually have people volunteering more than if you are in a situation where people are not used to doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I did some work in Bolivia where uh, there's a tiny, very, very poor community up in, in the mountains. They lost their water supply. And they essentially had no choice but to let, let all the grown-ups go to La Paz and, and, and look for, for alternative livelihoods while all the, 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 the elderly and the kids, the kids were taking out of school and the elderly, they spent four or five days or four or five hours a day just getting water. Mm-hmm. And then what we did was that we went in there and then we created a communal rotation so that instead of all the adults leaving at the same time, some of them stayed behind and then they all tended to each other's uh, fields. Mm-hmm. And then they took turns, so there was a rotation going on. And there, that by you didn't have to pull the kids out of the school and thereby you essentially enabled them to maybe, hopefully, at some point, lift the whole fine family out of poverty. But if you didn't do that and the kids did, did not get to school, you know, they, they would be lost in the sense mm-hmm. that you would just a step step back so but that was only possible because they as a community could see the value in pulling the resources and in care we've seen a lot of community we we form community groups around savings and loans and and around you know women where you have a lot of um, seasonal migration of men like for instance in Nepal we have seasonal migration of men to India where the women are clustered around in cooperatives so instead of, of them selling their, 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 their livestock because the campbells tend to the livestock in the fields, that they maintain the livestock and then some women take care of the older livestock and some and then other women take care of all the fields mm-hmm. and they shuffle around instead of having to make a very difficult choice like between one or the other as, as, a, as a household. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, yeah. We have three more questions. I see now one popping up. Uh, We have four more questions and seven more minutes, so we'll go through these four quickly. Um, The first one is from Steven Tyler, and that's the the climate change and resilience Steven Tyler, not the singer. And the question is, (laughs) assessing practices requires criteria for good practice in CBA. Where do those good practice criteria come from? (laughs) <laughs> that is a profoundly good question for you. <laughs> oh, and I'm laughing because, you know, I, I've left, I left CARE in February, but CARE is in the midst of, of essentially re-establishing a whole community of practice internally. And the reason for that is that they need to start documenting their lessons learned. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what we are up against is that the community or community-based adaptation um, it's still fairly young. I don't think it's, it's in its infant stages anymore. And I think it's about time that we start documenting what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. 
and those processes are in the works. But again, you're dealing with adaptation, right? So you need a certain time span before you can actually talk about whether something works or not. Otherwise, you're just talking about variability. Or even worse of all, what we saw in here in some programs is that you know a lot of the programs have a tendency of planning for current climate change and not mm. necessarily the future ones. Right? So you need you need first of all you need programs that are mature enough that you can actually look at what works and what doesn't, and then you need enough of them that you can start distilling some real lessons. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and it's a work in progress. Yeah. No, I I have to agree with you on that one. Um, Next question is from uh, uh, Kim Sun, my assistant, and he asks, um, how do you get um, local community and especially illiterate people uh, to identify indicators? Uh, does this mean that your m and &E will be mostly qualitative in nature or a mix or what is the result of that? Oh, that's a good question. Spot on. Um it's really interesting because as I was talking about, in it, the way we do it is that, that through this visualization process is that you come up with some outcome statements, what you would really like to see in the future. And then we use those to work backwards. So in other words, if you would, would like a, uh, like for instance, increased forest cover um, or forest resources, well, then you ask the person who came up with that statement. Well, if that's, that is what you would really like to see, what is the current situation? And then you can say, well, you know, this is the issue, or this is the issue, and this is wrong. And based on that, you create your baseline. But a lot of times, it is very subjective. Mm -hmm. So, what, and, and then based on that, you can come up with some indicators, and you can create some milestones. But I wouldn't say it's back of the envelope science. It's... We, what we are doing, or at least what I'm doing right now, is I am putting together a set of indicators that you can use to draw from. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that because there are limitations to participation, and I think especially because you have the time factor and the, the, the financial resource factor, I don't see anything wrong with developing and using this methodology to generate qualitative indicators that, that community members, they feel a real sense of ownership over. But then what I would recommend, if you do have a program involved in it, then actually complement those indicators with some more quantitative ones. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that will give you a better sense of, you know, a deeper sense of, you know, what, what is happening to capacity, what is happening to, to knowledge, you know, so that deeper analytical level that you need instead of just the, the, the descriptive type of indicator. Mm -hmm. There's um, some, some very exciting new processes where you can take qualitative indicators and quantify them. And I'm not an expert on that, but I, I, I think we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. in, in the first step of PMERL, and that's a question from Jiang Tran, um, the question is, this first step, uh, which are specific tools that you would use in step one, deciding what to monitor and measure? What to monitor and measure? Um, it, I'll, I'll take it back to the to the design. Uh, step one, deciding what to monitor and measure, and it has had three points: CBA process and practice, CBA outcomes, and context. Um, from the PMORL manual, what are specific tools? Very very short that um, you would use in those three elements of step one. Okay, you know I, I have the manual in front of me here, but I haven't I haven't marked them. What I would recommend, for, I can tell you what I would do, but also, again, one of the, the things I feel very strongly about tools is you don't apply a tool for the sake of applying a tool. Mm -hmm. You apply, you figure out what is it, what are the questions you have and what is it you want to do, what is the process you want, and then you make sure that you select tools that will help you get the type of answers you have gone for. But what I was alluding to here is that what I'm working on right now is I feel that if you, if you have your climate vulnerability and capacity assessment, that will give you the, the very much needed situation analysis. Mm -hmm. And to get a climate vulnerability and, and capacity assessment, there's a whole bunch of period tools you, you can go through. You know, you are doing mapping exercises and, and you are like, both in terms of what are the risks and, and what are the, you know, the, you, 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 you identify what the different assets or resources, the livelihood resources you have. You do when Venn diagrams to figure out what, what the, the stakeholders involved are, and then based on that, you extract your information that 
the change to livelihoods and disasters, also you, what, are, what are the shocks and, and stresses you're dealing with. Then you do, if you want to do a real ecosystem analysis, there are ways you can go about that as well. And if you don't have the resources to do it, at least you can map what are the, the, the what, what ecosystem are you in and what are the, the ecosystem benefits and services available to the community. Then you have that information. And then you look at the government governance structures as well. So based on that, you, you have a lot of, should we say, basic information to play. Mm -hmm. Then you do a community visioning exercise. And there's a rough outline of that in, in the manual. I've actually worked extensively on how to flesh that out. It's not really published anywhere at this point, but uh, you can write to me and I'll, I'll help you with some information. But also what we are doing increasingly within care is to link that to what I call a participatory scenario planning. And a participatory scenario planning is when you actually take local local based um, or, or local climate scenarios and you're looking at the forecasting for the particular area that you're in. And then you can do it based either on variability if you can't get it for the longer term trends and then try to forecast on behalf of that. Yeah. And then, but you also need to look at some of the trends in terms of what's happening to food security, what's happening to governance structures and whatever that could actually tilt some of the processes that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And all that is fleshed out in, in the manual. If you send me an email, I will actually guide you directly to, to where some of this is. Um, but also, more importantly, if, if you have never worked with the whole process of a theory of change, CARE has done um, has a substantial writing on that particular process and I can I can send you some webs website links to where you can find information because it's a way of working with different pathways at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating process and then Lucy's going to talk about how the RCAP program have figured out how to link it to Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question in this Q&A session um, is from Saif Ullah. And it has to do with the fact that the p moral approach um, really looks at community participation of stakeholders. Um, is there a role for mass social mobilization within the p moral approach? Is there a, a role for mass social mobilization? You, you, I can't hear you so well right now. Oh, sorry. Is there a role for mass social mobilization within the p moral approach? Hmm. What, what do you mean by mass social mobilization? I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing uh, that Saif means that um, when you focus on community participation, you're not going to do that with an entire community of 10,000 people. Not every single community <laughs> member will be there. But within the p moral steps, is there at some point um, um, some element of mass social mobilization? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm laughing because I'm reminded of, of a situation I ended up in in uh, in Africa. I think it was in, in uh, it was in Zimbabwe where people had gotten the wrong impression of why we were coming into a community. People thought we were handing out food, so the whole community showed up, and, it was, it, and we were trying to do focus focus group with them. So we ended up having what was it like almost 200 people in each focus group. It was it was quite challenging, but uh, very enlightening. Um, so to answer your question, yes, there are ways to do it. Um, what I would recommend is that <clears throat> a lot of times, if you're going to have very substantial discussions, it's it goes without saying that you can't do that with with a massive amount of people in one location. So what you do is that you essentially subdivide the community into specific focus groups, and you can do it according to livelihoods, or like say, will women and men and youth and elder, all sorts of whatever group in a given community it actually makes, makes sense to, to, to divide up. And sometimes you are, you are able to select one or maybe two representatives for each group. They will then convene and do part of the work. But then what you then do is that you feed back in plenary to the overall community and do presentations and show where you're at. And then you have and then maybe each focus group go back to their part of the community and discuss it, and then they can reconvene and take it forward. It all depends how participatory you want to be and, and how much time you have available, but there really are ways of making sure that you feed back. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of the, the processes I've been part of where 
where some of these focus group members, they're reporting back. It has been fantastic to see the dynamics that came out of it. People get very, uh, very engaged, actually, and um, kind of forget that they're shy and don't want to talk in front of everybody. It's, it's wonderful. So, yeah, there are ways. Tina, thank you for this, uh, for this webinar. It was a, a very interesting discussion. I think that's it. There are no more questions. And um, I, I really liked uh, hearing more about the PMORAL approach. And in uh, five hours from now, we will hear from, hear from Lucy, who will link to it, and uh, will talk about the RCAP approach. Um, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you to you, Dennis, for, for giving me the opportunity, but also for, for setting this up. And, and thank you to whoever either got out of bed or, or took the time to participate. Um, this is something that is really close to my heart. And uh, I just hope that, that, some, that you got a little bit out of it and maybe you can use some of it in your own work. That would be the best gift I could get. So good luck with it. And uh, thank you. Thank you. The recording of this webinar will be put online um, early next week and we will send out an email to all people registered um, so you will know where to download or to view the recording and also to access uh, relevant materials. If you would have any questions, my email will also be in, uh, in the email that will be sent around and I will also add Tina's email, in that, uh, Tina's email address in that mail that I'll send around early next week. Thank you for your time and for those who, uh, who are early in the morning, perhaps see you in five hours from now um, at the next webinar of uh, Lucy Faulkner. And Tina, again, thank you.